the next slide is, is conflicts of interest, and no doubt Sean will have uh, a greater knowledge of these conflicts potentially than I will. Um, the industry or the sector is um, potentially rife with conflicts. Um, if you look at uh, the press about um, that follow managing agents around, there is generally something in there about regularly about a conflict between the freeholders' relationship with the manager, the insurer, and the contractor that's appointed to do the works. And it's not uncommon for the, all four of these categories of freeholder, manager, insurer, and contractor to be owned by the landlord. And so obviously there, there is potential for conflicts to arise. Um, the conflict I put there, you know, there are plenty of dictionary definitions of what a conflict of interest is, and it, I've picked one of them, which is a situation in which a person has a duty to more than one person or organisation, but cannot do justice to the actual or potentially adverse interest of both parties. And that is more common, you know, it happens more commonly than you might think. Um, we had a, an example on a, a retirement development um, whereby we were appointed by the retirement development, which was, had formed a, a right to manage company. We were appointed by them um, to manage the, their interests. But in taking on that instruction, we didn't take responsibility for the, the member of staff who was transferred across from the previous manager under Tupi. But we managed their payroll. And this particular member of staff was, um, was causing concern, and we had to start looking into what action we could take. And when we approached a, a party, you know, solicitors, to advise the ma our client, the management company, on what what uh, action they should take, we were approaching this firm of solicitors on behalf of them, and they said the first thing was, well, we can't represent both of you. They said, well, we just want you to advise the management company, our client, what they should do. But it transpired that the, the advice given to the managing our client, the management company, is very different than, than the advice the solicitor would give to us. So we had to have two solicitors involved and because of this potential conflict. And both solicitors' firms were telling their, their clients to ensure that responsibility for the member of staff is passed to the other party. So in the event that everything goes wrong, mm. the other, you can sue the other party. So it's just really to be aware that the advice you will get from uh, depends on the perspective you're coming from. Uh, and um, it's, it, you know, it taught us a lesson, really, in that we have to be mindful of that. You know. um, so, yeah, that was a conflicted situation for the solicitor. Um, and there's, a, there's another example that was in, in the press this week of um, a freeholder um, wanting to charge a, a resident £5,000 for retrospective consent to put a conservatory on their property. And it was um, a retirement bungalow, and the extension had gone on 20 years prior, and it only came about when the, the sale was going through. And the house manager at this particular development could, could sign a letter to say this conservatory was installed 20 years ago when a lot of other lessees did the same and there was no consents requested at the time or to be granted. Um, now, if the house manager was allowed to do that, then the leaseholder wouldn't have to pay the, uh, the retrospective fee. But her position was conflicted because she wasn't allowed to, she wasn't allowed to put forward that statement because she worked for the manager who was owned by the, the, the landlord. So there's a conflict of interest there. She couldn't serve the landlord or the, um, the resident, the customer, at the same time. So it's just to be mindful that, um, that uh, where these conflicts can occur. Sean will no doubt be able to say yeah, a bit more say, on this than. Certainly, from a legal point of view, whenever we're taking on any new instruction, the first thing we have to do is check in this conflict because from our procedures, we can't move forward or do anything if we actually have, are currently acting for, the, for another party involved or have acted historically. There may still also be a conflict depending on what knowledge we have, which might impact on advice we give to the new, the new clients. Um, and it's a real it's a disciplinary issue for us if we haven't actually sorted out that conflict because it, it's so important because it could end up in um, complaints against us as a firm or in, in fact a professional negligence claim. Um, so it is really important but you do see it as David said in other areas that in a section 20 consultation for example that if a landlord has a connection to a contractor they're supposed to tell you about that connection. Um, it gets a bit more complicated if in fact the contractor or providing services is actually owned completely by the um, by, by the, the landlord, 
and there may be things you can do as a result of that, for example, arguing the reasonableness of the cost of those works. Um, certainly I have issues at the moment with, or certainly my clients have issues. Um, housing associations, for example, that they may have a direct labour force and the issue is can they, with their direct labour force, actually carry out work more cheaply than an external contractor and that's quite a big concern for them at the moment if in fact they ever get challenged. Um, because they'd have to actually justify that cost. So it's something that's worth considering and there may be something you can do about it if in fact you suspect a conflict. But each case depends on its own facts as to whether there's something you can do about it or not. Is there anything else that you want to I think conflicts of interest is a really important area. Anybody got any experience or anxieties or questions around conflicts of interest? Were the managing agents, I mean, if where the managing agent appoints the same contractors all of the time because he knows them and he has an experience of them, mm -hmm. we as leases just accept what the managing agent is appointing, but there could be an unseen conflict of interest there, mm -hmm. couldn't there, that mm -hmm. we don't know about. Um, so how do we get how do we get clarity? Well I suppose the first thing you could do is actually ask the managing agent if there's any existing connections. I don't know if that, yeah. if that ever happens. Yes, it doesn't. And you know, if you know, we have to tell the leaseholders if we have a connection with any of the contractors. Now, um, but but you, but you don't you don't actually have to do that. You would because of the reputation of your company. But there will be other companies which, which I've worked with who don't tell you that information. And even when you ask, won't tell you. I believe that you're duty bound to inform yeah. your customers and clients if there is a com potential conflict of interest and also with Arma Q which is coming out now which is self-regulation of the property se sector then it's a, re a requirement of that to disclose um, as part of your membership and accreditation so they should do but all I'd say to leaseholders is, is ask the questions directly of your managing agent ask you know, do you have a connection with this contractor because they appear to be doing all the work yeah. and they all have to tell you the truth um, you can do simple company checks as well to see if the directors mm -hmm. of, of your management company or managing agent uh, are also listed as directors of that firm as well um, <coughs> yeah, you have a right to this information so I'd say you know, ask you know, I'd hope they would be transparent with you and if they are and there is, is no connection well that's served a, a great purpose and then you can have con Confidence, you know, going forward. We had an example of that, and I don't want to deal with it too much because it will come up in the third session over buildings insurance. And we <coughs> have over, we're going to come in and talk about insurance issues. Um, but we discovered the, doing a company's house search that the directors of our um, managing agent were also directors of the insurance brokerage based on the Isle of Man who were charging us three times what, when we got rid of them, we could actually get buildings insurance for. It was unbelievable, the uh, shock that we had. And it was only when we went into it that we found that they'd never told us that there was that connection at all, but that this was the best they could get, and you know this was a you know, national way of doing it, and they were following good practice in the industry, all the stuff that you find without giving us that information that, in fact, uh, the directors were saying. Can I just ask you, I'm not sure if it's awareness, but we've just received a letter saying that um, our freehold of the our apartments has changed. Um, it, it's not relevant from a point of view of conflict, but um, normally what would happen is if, in fact, the freehold is being sold, then um, as leaseholders you have the rights to you're given the first chance to actually buy the freehold. Yeah. Does it matter at what point that happened? So if it was two years ago that they agreed it was all sold off and then suddenly they've only just told us? Um, they're not under an, a, a statutory obligation to tell you, but from the point of view of if they're collecting ground rents, then at the time when they decide to collect that ground rent, then obviously they have to tell you, they have to serve various notices on you that says who the landlord is, where notices can be served on the etc etc uh, from the point of view of ground rents I mean some landlords claim it and some sitting on the scheme that I've got a house that the landlord hasn't actually claimed the ground rent for a few years but they, they can go back up to six years to actually claim that at any stage so I don't think there's anything necessarily 
wrong about it other than there should have been an offer of a freehold to leaseholders at the time that that freehold was actually sold. We had an experience at City Key recently where the freehold was sold and we weren't consulted right. because the business was sold with a lot of freeholds in it. Right. And therefore they said we weren't able to be given first refusal because it wasn't the freehold to our development that was being sold, but the business that contained all the freeholds. Right. Yeah, there's some company law issues there. Well, not yeah. issues, problems, but yeah. it, it, it could have been a way around it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily want the freehold. Um, we were offered the freehold in the scheme I got a house in South Ray Key. And we decided that we had sufficient control because I'm a director of the management company, which is a part of the lease. There wasn't any real benefit for us persuading the 58 owners to, to cough up, even though it was only going to be a few thousand pounds, but because we had, we've got sufficient control um, with, under the terms of our lease, so I certainly was quite relaxed about it. Other schemes you might find, especially smaller ones, that you do want to have that control. You've got that control with Armstrong Key, haven't you? We have, yes. You've bought the freehold. We've bought the freehold, yeah. 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 Do you want to speak in favour of why you did that? And uh, what benefit, if any, it's brought you? I think the benefit is a free, if you have the freehold yourself. And um, when I say a freehold, you have to set up a freehold company. So it, it is a corporate body rather than an individual body, and you have participants within that freehold company. But we felt that we wanted to purchase the freehold because uh, the destiny of the development of the site was in our own hands. We could dictate what happens on the site. You know, the, the existing freehold that could have said, sort of maybe built another block, which would have spoiled a view, um, could have taken up some grass areas and created car parking, which not everybody would want. So they're the sorts of issues that we wanted to try and um, <coughs> maintain control of, and the only way to do that was to purchase that freehold. Thomas? Do you mind have a quick experience in the um, National Bank building, um, David, that you're familiar with as well? And um, the freehold was offered a few years ago, I think for 15,000 pounds, 28 developments. And in retrospect, we wish we had bought it because um, it's a mixed development with a, a commercial unit in the ground floor. Mm -hmm. And that um, appears to keep us from forming an um, RTM because it exceeds the 25% rule. And um, that um, freeholder is just a parasitic third party that's um, causing so much pain. And um, they the, um, the started to enforce lots of items in the lease that hadn't been enforced from the previous ones, for example, demanding um, uh, that you get permission to sublet. Um, so, of course, this, I think one. Um, owner occupier in the whole building and the rest is um, renting out and um, they need um, permission to let they have to um, um, submit the a copy of the um, rent and uh, the tenancy agreements and get permission and to pay for having those filed um, that whole um, freehold is managed by um, Forte Freehold which is just a bulk management company who, who, whose job is to raise revenues from the block and they have no interest whatsoever mm -hmm in improving the state of the block or doing anything for the building, so I, um, we hate them with a passion and we wish we had about the free to free order mm -hmm. stuff. So I think just from hearing that, that everyone has different experiences on their own particular developments, whether it's something to be considered or not. 